Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Miles, and I'm the chair of the automobile, automobile division of the IMEC -E here in, in Essex. And I'd like to welcome you all to our lecture tonight on the Ford Puma ST and the MHEV derivative. Um, just to remind everybody, we do our next talk from the South Essex area is around a new build, but a very different type of build. And this is actually a recreation of a steam locomotive, an LNER Class B17 460 Spirit of Sandringham. And this is a recreation of a classic steam train, uh, but as a new steam train. Uh, if you need to, if you want to know any more about that, please go to the IMEC -E near you page and register, and you can find out more about joining the virtual lecture. But on to Puma. The new Ford Puma is proving to be more and more popular as the year goes on. It's the fifth best-selling car in the UK this month, and this crossover has catapulted itself into the top 10 best-selling cars of the year in the UK. We have tonight some of the key people involved in developing the vehicle. I'd like to introduce first Dr. Sigurd Limbach. He's the Vehicle Programs Director for Product Development for Ford of Europe. And he has a master's degree in vehicle engineering from Aachen University and did his PhD in the field of combustion engines at the University of Graz. He's worked in various positions in Ford and today he heads the European BC, CD and import car line programs. Stefan Munzinger, is, he gained a bachelor's degree in automotive engineering from the University of Cologne and an MBA in Phoenix, in Phoenix, Arizona, in North America. Stefan work, has also worked in various positions for 25 years in Ford, and he now leads the Ford performance team. And finally, Athel Raj gained his MSc in automotive design and system engineer, system analysis from the University of Huddersfield before joining Ford 10 years ago, and has experience in product development and has had a number of roles in Ford. Athel currently leads the feature calibration on the mild hybrid passenger vehicle lines in Ford of Europe. Now, in terms of the lecture, what we'd like to do is if for the Q&A session, if people would like to leave their questions on the chat, and we will then take those chat questions and put them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. So if you, if you want to add a question, please add it in the chat as we go along. We'll then sum those questions up and, uh, and, and ask those questions at the end. I'd now like to hand over to Sigurd Lindbach. He's based in our Cologne, in Ford's Cologne office. And uh, welcome, Sigurd. Yeah, good evening, uh, team. And I hope you can hear and see me OK. Thank you, uh, Steve, for the, uh, the nice introductions. So I'm going to give you some overviews and uh, some insight in the Puma overall uh, before my colleagues will get deeper into the mild hybrid and the ST element of, um, of the Puma. So first of all, Puma is um, in the fastest growing segment in Europe. This is the mini utility segment. And this segment is supposed to be, in about two years, the biggest segment overall in Europe, with a share of roughly 23 to 25%. And we have introduced uh, Puma early this year, as you know, um, I think at the, absolutely the right time. And despite all the, the COVID lockdowns, it became a very successful vehicle already this year. Uh, we are already market leaders in some of the key European markets. So what are the secrets to its success? So there's obviously a big uh, styling and design cue to that. I'm not going to go into that level of detail on the design and styling simply because that would fill an hour. Um, you all know Puma is a very, um, you know, a strong styling in terms of stance. Um, I would like uh, today to concentrate on the uh, technical innovations, uh, the secrets of what made the Puma so unique in terms of its positioning and its um, uniqueness factors against the competition. So let me start. Um, so first page is a bit of dry foot. Um, I know that's a lot of numbers, 
but it's important to um, to let you know uh, that Puma is based on the Fiesta B2E platform. This obviously is a very capable platform that everyone knows of in the B-car segment in terms of dynamics and fun to drive, etc. So we thought this is an excellent platform uh, to, to grow on and to build the Puma on. And you see here the dimensions we have grown in terms of lengths and heights and wheelbase, etc. So for instance, on lengths, we have grown by roughly 15 centimeters. Very important is the track width. I will circle back to that later on, simply because the track width has grown to a C car level. So track width is meanwhile on focus slash golf level for good reasons. We come to that later, as I said. And uh, very important as well is luggage capacity of 456 liters, which is absolutely class leading by far. Um, and we've done that for really good uh, reason, practicality, etc. So if we start a bit um, at the rear of the vehicle um, of what we have done uh, uniquely. So first of all, very important to our customers are usability, versatility, etc., especially on a small vehicle. So we really paid attention to detail on everything in the trunk space. So what you see is a white, a white opening width of a, of a complete meter. And uh, there is no interrupting obstacles in the way, such like a subwoofer, first aid kit. We've all nicely packaged that one away. So what you see is this really great space. And you can fit this on the top right. You see this uh, one meter IKEA box. In, uh, in this B-car vehicle, which is quite a unique uh, kind of um, opportunity here. Um, what you see on the uh, bottom left is the uh, lift gate mounted to, um, sorry, the partial shell lift um, mounted to the lift gate. And uh, that is also an innovation that we have patented. It, it offers a lot of opportunities because simply, Typically, what happens um, the first time you kind of load it much, it, it, the part is in your way, and you put this outside your vehicle in the garage, and then it just collects dust. So this one is never in your way because it opens with the trunk, and then you have a free, you know, visible area inside the trunk. It gives you a much bigger feel and uh, not kind of a feel of darkness because you have that roller cover, toner cover, etc. It's a really great innovation and nicely executed. So it's really this paying attention to detail that makes this uh, first impression on the trunk um, so great. So we have one thing which really is outstanding then um, beyond the one that we've just shown you, and that I would like to show you in the next video and kind of talk to that one. So first of all, we have an auto lift gate, uh, foot operated, which is kind of unique. But the key secret is the thermoplast glass fiber uh, strengthened, we call that mega box. It features 80 liters. And um, you see here the width and the height. Um, the vertical height is also very important. You see that on some of the use cases, like the golf bags, for instance, um, you have a huge kind of possibility of versatility. Very important and a key use case is this is a dirty wet zone. You can plug in all these kind of things. And there's this little thing like this plug at the bottom, which make it really a great experience for the customers and for the consumers. And I can tell you one anecdote, which I think is, is kind of uh, very emotional because when we presented this video to our Ford internal reveal of the Puma, it's the first time in my 25 years of Ford career um, I got standing ovations and I felt a bit like a rock star simply because the people got, you know, this kind of emotional thing and connectiveness to this feature, even though it's just the box and just the, um, the drainage plug at the bottom. And for those of you interested um, on YouTube, you see various kind of gimmicks, what you can do with the box. It's from, you know, goldfish is swimming in there up to, uh, washing your docks and all fancy stuff. So I think a great, great innovation. So let's uh, let's keep moving now to the front of the vehicle. So um, on the details of the EcoBoost Hybrid, um, Athol will uh, lead to that one later on, but just high level. Uh, we offer uh, the uh, EcoBoost Mild Hybrid in two uh, horsepower versions, 125 and 155 PS. 
The 155 is exclusively offered uh, as a mild hybrid, and there is a very good reason. Um, we needed to apply a larger turbo, and the larger turbo typically has as a kind of a downside, uh, a turbo lack at the uh, lower engine speed arena, and we needed the mild hybrid technology to fill that gap. So that's why the 155 is only available as a mild hybrid. Fuel economy um, efficiency is 10% incremental in city driving. And on the 155 PS, it's even 15% because it's a combination of the mild hybrid and downsizing. Because typically the 155 PS variant is uh, a 1.5 liter engine. And we've now done that with the one liter mild hybrid um, with a larger turbo. So um, quite a nice package. And you see here the certified uh, fuel economy figures that are really uh, best in class in that um, segment in both NEDC and the WLTP world. Um, beyond the powertrain, uh, we have basically turned every screw um, to achieve those good numbers. So it's not only the powertrain. So despite the, uh, the quite um, strong um, styling cues, uh, we still targeted and we achieved uh, equal to best and class competitors on aero performance uh, with a lot of shielding, a lot of um, fine tuning of the details here as well. We paid quite a lot of attention to weight and um, to give you a key figure, so we only added roughly 60 kilograms versus the Fiesta while the size, uh, you've seen that in the beginning, has grown quite a lot, right? So 60 kilograms. And this was also enabled, again, and here I quote the mega box, um, more space, more usability, more versatility, but this glass fiber um, strength and thermoplast is a lower weight than the uh, traditional steel um, deep drawn uh, spare wheel well. So that's a quite nice, um, innovation here that leads to many attribute uh, benefits from the technical point of view. Um, payload, obviously, um, if you have a lot of space, you want to you wanna be able to fill a lot in, and 565 kilograms of payload is quite, quite a, um, a strong statement, I would think. And last but not least, we put the latest uh, A-plus tire generation on the car to achieve that overall good fuel economy. So um, there is no Ford presentation without uh, driving dynamics. This is closest to our heart. This is our DNA. This is right where our heart is pulsating. So in order to make the uh, Puma drive as dynamically and also from the handling perspective and steering as close as possible to the uh, Fiesta, um, as I said in the beginning, we increase the track width dramatically in order to compensate for the higher uh, center of gravity. And uh, we've also turned most, if not all, of the screws on the suspension and the steering. So you see new lower control arms, knuckles, struts, um, dampers all tuned, bushes new, the top mounts new. In the rear, we have a new twist beam with uh, more than 50% increased uh, stiffness. Uh, the EPA system is all new, uh, lower friction, higher torque support to have more tuning range of uh, the steering feel. And we are offering five selective drive modes, uh, normal eco sport, slippery and off-road, with different settings of the, um, the, the hybrid support and recuperation, pedal mapping, uh, steering feel, AC performance, and, and or focus on, on economy, etc. So quite a good um, choice for the customer here in terms of um, what he likes to select. Um, driver assist technologies um, become more and more um, important in, in these days, and um, it's obviously a topic we could technically fill a lot of uh, minutes and hours. Um, I don't want to do that here in detail. Um, so far, we have basically used all of the focus um, features that we have in the C uh, car platform and have brought them down to the B car level. And some of these features, um, Ford is the first to offer them in the B and the, um, the, uh, the mini utility segment. For instance, the last one on the page is quite an enhanced feature 
that typically is only known in premiums and, and CD cars like adaptive cruise control with stop and go and lane censoring, um, obviously only offered on the, uh, the, the dual clutch automatic. Um, so it's quite a, a, a comprehensive uh, big package of, of features that we're offering here to the customers. There is one feature that I've picked here in yellow I would like to allude to uh, a bit more because the Puma is the first Ford vehicle that offers local hazard information and uh, how that feature works um, is kind of illustrated on the next page. So basically this is um, a software and a cloud system which is kind of offered by a company called HERE um, and it's a consortium out of meanwhile five or it might be now six different OEMs that participate in that consortium. Ford is one of them. And uh, that system works in the following way. So if any kind of um, incident happens, in this case it's an accident on the picture, you see on the next page of video, um, the vehicle that has the accident uh, transmits a signal to uh, a central uh, cloud point uh, via the embedded modem. And then the backend um, in, the, in the cloud computes uh, the data and it transmits it to, um, in this case, the blue vehicle, which is approaching the accident, and sends a warning signal out like accident ahead, uh, be careful. So kind of you're allowed to, 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 to watch around the corner. So quite a nice uh, feature and uh, the next video uh, that I'm going to run, I think um, it doesn't run fully smoothly because of the, uh, the bandwidth, but it shows you how the feature works. So in this case, the transit had an accident or so there were some obstacles. And um, by turning on the uh, ABS braking, so ABS braking lights, it's a kind of an indication there must be some, some obstacles or some strange um, things on the road. So it emits a signal to the cloud and the cloud transmits it to the next one. This is an accident, a uh, flat tire. And by turning on the, uh, the, uh, the, the warning light and opening the door, this is also transmitted and it's a signal there's something going on on the road and the traffic behind it is being alerted. So that also works for different other scenarios. For instance, if multiple vehicles switch on the fog lights, or the ABS system goes on, on an IC bridge, on two consecutive vehicles, you can be sure there must be some slippery roads, IC roads, etc. So then also the, the next driver is being informed and warned. So I think quite a smart feature. Um, it's growing in the industry. We are part, you know, amongst the first to apply this. Puma was the first vehicle and we're now rolling it out to our other vehicles in our overall portfolio. So last slide from my side. Um, there's multiple more things, uh, just uh, four more remaining here. So wireless charging is being offered. Um, also quite unique in the B-car segment is lumbar massage seats. Um, quite nicely if you drive longer journeys or standing in a lot of traffic jams, you always uh, get you to your destination in a quite relaxed manner. Um, what we think is a quite nice feature is uh, removable seat covers because uh, they may get worn as the car is getting older or you want new trims, um, different materials or new graphics. You want maybe leather instead of um, fabrics, etc. There's multiple opportunities um, to kind of re-equip new trims to your uh, rear and to your front seats. And um, we also feature um, a big 12.3-inch uh, uh, digital cluster. Uh, you see that at the bottom right. And um, when you switch through the different drive modes, um, it also changes the graphics in the, in the display. So um, quite an emotional um, experience for the customer as well. With that, I would like to finish my uh, high-level overview of the innovations and would like to hand over to my colleague uh, Stefan Münzinger for um, the, um, the ST version. Thank you. Yeah, 
Thanks, sehr gut. Um, <coughs> Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is uh, Stefan Münzinger. As Sigurd mentioned, I'm uh, the manager for Ford Performance Europe. And uh, yeah, my team had the pleasure to uh, take Puma Base, which is a, a, drive, a great driving car. And Sigurd uh, elaborated on some of the ingredients of uh, what makes it a, a great driving car. But the target here was to basically turn this into a proper, a proper ST. And, um, uh, if we switch to the next slide, when I say proper ST, what I really mean is uh, fun to drive. Uh, you know, if you look at our product lineup, uh, Fiesta ST, Focus ST, at the end of the day, it's all about fun to drive. And uh, with doing a, an ST on Puma, it's basically introducing that concept, that idea, into the compact SUV segment, which is somewhat unique. There, you know, we had looked at competition like vehicles like T-Rock Sport and BMW X2 with an M package. We benchmarked those cars, and you know, while on the powertrain side, they're actually quite performing quite good, comparable. Um, you know, when you drive these cars in terms of character, it was pretty clear to us that that is nowhere close to where we want to position this ST product. Now, the only competitor that really maybe somewhat came close was a, um, um, a mini countryman, John Cooper Works. Um, but that's a vehicle which is by far more expensive than, than our car here. So we think we're in a somewhat unique spot with this vehicle, um, delivering a proper SD in the small SUV segment, but uh, at, an at an affordable price range, right? much lower than some of the competitors. So fun to drive being the overarching premise of any Ford performance product and really in the essence of fun to drive, the vehicle dynamics is in the, is, is in the core of this. And, and when I say great vehicle dynamics, it's not just a matter of speed, but it's a matter of, of character really on how you deliver the dynamics. You know, you want a playful character but confidence. You want a lively vehicle but still predictable. And, um, so the challenge here was clearly the center of gravity, doing that on a Puma, because a high center of gravity is, is really not your vehicle, vehicle dynamics best friend. So in order to deliver this typical ST driving experience as we do in a Fiesta or a Focus, we really had to find some clever ideas and come up with some good engineering solutions to counteract the high center of gravity. And in the next couple of slides, I'm actually gonna show you a few things of how we did that. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so that one is, um, it really starts with steering, right? Steering is in the heart of any ST. So we have a significantly quicker ratio on the Puma ST versus um, the base Puma. It's actually 11.4 11, 11 to one, which is about 25% quicker steering response. And um, so, the ratio is one thing, then obviously the torque build up uh, wh when you turn the steering is the other thing. And we really have a consistent approach over the ST lineup, Fiesta Focus and now Puma ST. Quite unique steering characteristic, which is, um, yeah, I, I can claim much appreciated by, I think, the majority of customers and, and also the media. Then front knuckle, as uh, Igor mentioned, that Puma Base got a new front knuckle on the ST. We even did another new knuckle because the knuckle geometry is quite important for two things. Um, it impacts steering ratio. So we have a shorter um, distance to 0.11, sorry, 0.12 um, to support the steering ratio. And then we also upped the position of 0.6 on the, on the knuckle to adjust the roll center heights. You know, we lo actually lowered the roll center heights on this car. That's what we always do on ST vehicles. When you lower the roll center heights, you actually gain front grip and you reduce understeer. That's the reason why 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 we do this. So we went, you know, took the extra mile and just for ST uh, developed this new knuckle. Then stiffness, uh, twist beam stiffness in the rear. Um, they have this is probably the stiffest twist beam we've ever done in Ford Motor Company. It has a stiffness of 1933 newton meter per degree. And that's simply done for you know, to have less body roll and also provide more agility. If you have more stabilization in the rear, you get more tail happy. 
and that's really what we want on an ST. And uh, so typically, when you increase stiffness, you just do you know go thicker on the U profile, which we did. But we, we that you can only take that to a certain extent. And um, then we introduced actually somewhat of an innovation here. We there's another torsion bar, additional torsion bar inside the U profile to um, deliver the stiffness that that we wanted to get. And then for vectoring springs, that's not really a technology unique to ST. Other Ford products also have this. Nonetheless, it's a quite helpful technology in particular also for ST. It's actually, Ford has a patent on this. It, and it, basically, it's an asymmetric uh, spring design, which generates a side force when being compressed. So when you're cornering, you, you know, you have a counter force to the side, which somewhat you know, helps you on um, stabilizing the car. And then last but not least, uh, we have obviously unique uh, chassis settings, harder bushes all around, a thicker front anti-roll bar, and then uh, springs and shocks uniquely uh, designed and tuned for ST. And next slide. Yeah, so on the shocks, um, we introduced a technology um, somewhat new, at least in the, in the B-car world. Uh, we didn't find another competitor that is doing this on B-car. It's called a frequency responsive dampers. And it's the, the uh, dampers feature an additional valve inside, inside the, uh, the main valve. And that additional valve basically opens up when, you, when, the, um, when the damper is um, moving with high frequencies, like 10 hertz or higher. And you typically get these high frequencies when you drive over, let's say, rough tarmac, broken surfaces. So that's actually where you want, where you don't want a damper being too stiff. You want you want the damper damper to actually allow movement and travel for these small amplitudes, but high frequency, to not have too much harshness in the car. But at the same time, uh, if you don't have FRD, you would lose control under normal bigger events. So um, where you want the control. So having this technology, you can do both. You can have the control uh, for single smaller events uh, where you where you want to limit vehicle movement and and then but non nonetheless uh, counteract um, for the high frequencies and and don't give up too much on on, ro on rolling plushness. We then very important also tire tires always a key ingredient um, uh, to to an ST. And we have a uniquely developed Michelin Pilot 4S tire. It's out of the Michelin high performance tire lineup. Pretty grippy tire, but also we uniquely developed the whole construction together with Michelin and focused in particular on steering. Steering on center response always very important for an ST that was high up on the priority list. So um, it's, a, it's actually a, a very good performing tire, like I said, high, very high grip level. Um, and this time, for first for the first time, we introduced a unique Ford performance specification. So there is a FP marking on the sidewall of the tire. So you can also order this particular spec uh, in the Michelin aftermarket channels if you want replacement tires. And then there is, um, as on Fiesta, there's an optional quiet limited slip differential, um, obviously for optimized uh, front grip. And then a larger brake system, 325 millimeters. That's a very capable brake system. Um, we actually spent quite a bit of time tuning this car also out at the Nürburgring. And I, I can guarantee you it actually also performed quite well out there on the racetrack. So it's, uh, it, it's a very, very capable brake system. Next slide. Okay, that shows gives you some details on um, the uh, the engine specifications in particular. It's pretty much a carryover um, Fiesta ST engine, but um, with higher torque. So Fiesta also has 200 PS, but Fiesta has 290 newton meter. We up this to 320 newton meter, and then uh, you know VMAX 220. 0 to 100 at 6.7 seconds. It's only 0.1 seconds slower than Fiesta. And, uh, you know, I obviously higher torque is one enabler for this, but we also shortened the final drive versus Fiesta to counteract the, um, 
yeah, larger tires and also additional weight. Yeah, and um, so I think that's, I think the next slide will give show us a torque curve. Let's move to that. Yeah, so that's uh, the orange curve is Fiesta ST. So here the solid, the solid orange curve on the on the lower one basically is a steady state torque. That's the two ninety newton meters uh, on Fiesta. Then there is an overboost function on Fiesta, which actually takes it to three hundred newton meters. And then the um, the dotted blue curve is um, Puma ST steady state, and the solid red curve is um, Puma ST overboost. So you basically see that um, we took it to 320 newton meter peak, and also um, you know peak power then and on the higher RPM is identical compared to overboost on the Fiesta. On the lower RPM, we actually uh, took away a little bit from the overboost function on Fiesta, and that simply had to be done due to higher weight and dual mass flywheel durability. There's you know there's some uh, excitation at the lower RPM, and uh, we couldn't quite get the Fiesta overboost numbers here, but um, anything above 1800 RPM, we are actually higher than Fiesta. Okay, and uh, next slide. Yeah, that's uh, an, that's a drive mode matrix. So we have four drive modes in the car. Uh, for the first time, we actually have an eco mode. Um, then there's normal mode, sport mode, and track. Um, and now you can also activate the drive modes on this via the uh, switch on the steering wheel here. On Fiesta, we only have that switch in the center console, which is not really ideal to be honest, because you know when you switch, want to switch drive modes, you always need to look on, into the center console to somewhat find the button. So having this on the steering wheel is clearly an advantage. And there are two mode, two buttons. Sorry, there is a mode button where you simply just toggle through the modes. And then, then there is an S button, which is a direct sport select button. So wherever you are, if you, if you push the S button, you're always in directly in, in sport mode. And you can see the things that we, that is changing with the drive modes, right? It's engine stuff, engine control, like that's pedal mapping, basically engine response. Then um, uh, stop start, either being active or deactivated. Um, cylinder deactivation. It's active in normal and not active in sport and track. And we have more cylinder deactivation, so more aggressive a two cylinder mode in eco mode. And then chassis is changing, steering, steering feel, um, the efforts, and then traction control, ESC. Sound character is also changing a bit with the EASY system with the modes and also the exhaust valve uh, aggressiveness is changing. And then last but not least, there is a uh, performance shift light and uh, what's the last, I don't have my glasses on here, what's the last one on the page here? Climate control, exactly. And then there are two additional switches. Um, it's an ESC switch, so it's also unique to ST. We all have in all our ST cars. You can actually either uh, manually overwrite um, uh, ESC by going into a reduced mode or completely turn ESC off. And that's, I think, it's quite unique in the industry that you can turn the system completely off. And there is also a, a launch control feature. Then uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, it's almost my last slide here, I think. So styling-wise, um, a bunch of Ford Performance and ST specific styling elements. Uh, obviously, uh, the wheels um, is quite unique. It's 19-inch alloy wheels. Uh, they come in two versions, either completely painted or uh, or polished. Then we have a dual pipe exhaust, um, stainless steel with with the valve that I mentioned earlier. And then a part I, I you know I'm a big fan of. It's the front splitter. It's uh, an aerodynamic part which is mounted to the bottom part of the of the front bumper. Has Ford Performance imprint on it, and it's a, it's a really a part that is a win-win for drag. It reduces the drag, but at the same time increases downforce. So um, it's a functional part, and it also looks pretty cool. Then recover seats standard on ST, and um, yeah, ST logo projections. And actually, there's a, the puddle lamp um, has the ST logo. So when you approach the car and you Use your key to open the vehicle. You have a nice ST logo on the bottom, 
And then uh, the color, it's that uh, mean green color is actually unique to ST. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that color. It looks really, really amazing, especially in the sunlight. It's a pretty um, emotional color, I should say. Then next slide. Okay, and that pretty much completes the presentation. Um, I think so in essence, like I said in the beginning, the target was clearly to create a proper ST, right? Uh, some challenges involved with this, in particular due to high center of gravity. We think we found some good engineering solutions to, to counteract and to deliver a proper ST drive experience. And uh, there's actually a, a link uh, shown here. I think it's also shared with the, with the invite. Uh, you can, if you like, you can uh, take a look at YouTube. There's a walk around uh, presentation that I'm giving, uh, giving some more detail on the car. Maybe some of the stuff maybe will be repetitive. I went through some of the things here today, but yeah, if you're if you're up for it, take a look. And then if you if you get a chance, I, I suggest you you drive the car and um, make up your own mind. With that, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I would like to hand over to. Um, and the two, uuh, the, um, the, the power trim bit. Thank you, Atul, it's your, your show. Thank you, Stefan. Hope everyone can hear me. Is Lawrence here? I can. Thank you. Um, so, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Atul Raj. Um, I work in the uh, electrified power trim department within. Uh, Foods, and this is a part of a uh, powertrain function within uh, product development. And my team uh, where I work is predominantly responsible for um, application development of uh, electrified powertrains within Ford and Lincoln vehicle. Um, we've got currently these three products out there in the market, uh, starting with the Puma EcoBoost Mild Hybrid, which is the one of interest today, and also um, two plug-in hybrids in the form of Transit EcoBoost and the Kruger plug-in hybrid as well. So um, Puma um, mild hybrid is, is the second mild hybrid that um, Ford has delivered to a European market. The first one was in the form of uh, transit mild hybrid. Um, and, and this is the third generation of electrification technology uh, that is on sale uh, from Ford. And we have the Gen 4 being prepared by our uh, best engineers here in Dunton and Makanish. And uh, that will be coming up for sale from 2021 onwards. So talking about Puma EcoBoost Mild Hybrid, um, we've gone into the details of how the vehicle is specced up, how, what kind of customer base we are looking to uh, capture, and also the details of how much the engine specifications have been uh, dealt with as well. Uh, so I'm going to cover the details of uh, the Mild Hybrid specifications, specifically how um, we were able to convert a conventional um, internal combustion engine powertrain to a Mild Hybrid system and bring it into mass production here. So uh, to do that conversion, we started off um, with a, a battery pack, as you can imagine, um, because we need to store the energy uh, that is uh, recuperated in the vehicle. Um, the battery is, is a 48 volt battery pack, uh, 12 kilowatt beginning of life uh, power rated, and that uh, underneath the front passenger seat. And also we've got a DC DC to convert the 48 volt uh, that the battery stores into 12 volt so that um, all the uh, all the um, 12 volt consumers in the car can be uh, powered as well. So that includes the lights, the radios, um, GPS, you name it, all the consumers that, that a typical driver will touch uh, with their hand and, and use on their daily drive. And all this is, is made uh, happen by using a, a belt integrated starter generator which uh, replaces the traditional traditional alternator on a conventional internal combustion engine. Um, so this belt integrated starter generator can act both as a motor and as a generator at the same time, whenever that is required. And all this is controlled by the by the powertrain control module, which which is a big computer on its own, which controls the engine and the mild hybrid system uh, together. Before we go into the mild hybrid bits, uh, I'd like to show the topology of where we sit with the mild hybrid in the whole hybrid uh, package uh, envelope and, and, and so that everybody gets an idea of what we are going to cover in this presentation. Uh, so if we start on the x-axis with, with the pack voltage, that is the voltage of the battery that, that the vehicle carries in, in some sort of electrification package. 
um, and as the x-axis grows, we are increasing the voltage, and the y-axis shows the power delivery by the package. So a mild hybrid is a typical 48 volt system, and that is able to uh, power at least 12 kilowatts um, uh, on its own, um, and that falls within the low voltage domain of, of the uh, hybrid system. As we start transitioning above 60 volts, we go into the high voltage territory, and, and that gets into the other types of um, uh, hybrid vehicles. Predominantly BEV, we have and have as such. So, so the system capability and, and the fuel economy contributions of all these different hybrid powertrains depend predominantly on the battery power that that uh, that goes into the vehicle or the pack voltage that goes into the vehicle. So, if we take a look at uh, before going into MHz again, if we take a look at the BEV, we have and the and the F have uh, on on how that uh, works so that everybody uh, understands it. Um, the, the hybrid vehicle types can be, on a higher level, uh, can be classified into three different types. If we start with the HEVs, uh, this um, kind of way hybrid vehicles have an internal combustion uh, to start with, and then it's got some sort of an electrification as well. So it's got batteries and a more frame generator unit as well. So this is also known as a, a self-charging hybrid in, in the industry. So some of the OEMs refer to as self-charging hybrids. The reason being, you, you cannot charge the batteries from an external source. So the only sort of fuel that goes into the vehicle is, is the, the traditional fossil fuel that is uh, going into an IC engine, internal combustion engine. And now when we add a, a, a power socket to um, charge the vehicle from an external wall socket, for example, that becomes a plug-in hybrid. And these kind of vehicles will have a, um, a capability for the customer to, to charge the vehicle at their home or on their drive um, in between when they're taking rest in a fuel station. If the right kind of charger is there, uh, you'll be able to charge the, the batteries uh, on its own. And when you take off the internal combustion engine completely and increase the battery size, that becomes a battery electric vehicle where um, the, the sole uh, source of power that goes into the into the vehicle and, and sole source of uh, propulsion that we, that we get out of the vehicle is based on the battery capacity and, and the battery capacity actually actually determines how um, far the vehicle can drive and how how big the the claimed fuel economy or the drive um, uh, distance is, is. So on a bell, the vehicle's uh, performance is predominantly uh, uh, defined by the battery performance. However, on the rest of the uh, hybrid types, um, the hybrid system's job is mainly to help the internal combustion engine under transient conditions. And, and this, this middle bit between where we have a traditional uh, internal combustion engine along with some sort of hybridization is, is a really complex area from a, from a powertrain perspective because we, uh, we will start looking at the complexity of managing a, a traditional uh, internal combustion engine and also the hybrid system as well and provide the customer the best of both worlds. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm just showing with these graphs here. So on, on, a, on the book end, if we see the 12 volt system with the traditional um, internal combustion engine, we've got very uh, less powertrain features that is available for curing or calibrating in the first place. Um, however, if we look at the book end for the best, again, there is hardly any um, internal combustion engine component that gets tuned or developed in the first place. Tuning. However, in the middle, um, if we have some sort of an, uh, a hydrization that is happening in the middle, as a powertrain um, commodity, we are looking at a, a heavy complexity in, in terms of um, developing uh, functions and tuning it to the right level so that people get the best, customers get the best out of it. And, and a lot of people uh, ask me uh, when, when, when they see this kind of slides, is that what, what is the advantage of uh, like going above increasing power? increasing the voltage uh, from 12 to 48 to 144 or, or higher and, uh, and, and on and on. So I'd like to show you a, a quick calculation right to the very basics of, of engineering and, and uh, school days probably um, and, and take you through some basic calculations on showing you what is the advantages of going increasing voltage. If you take a basic cell and, and start looking at um, a, a cell that is connected onto a bulb, for example, if the cell is, a, imagine, a, a 3 kilowatt battery, and it's a 12 volt battery, for example, if you look at the middle columns. Uh, if we take some basic uh, PVI equations that, is, uh, that we studied, the amount of current that goes from the battery is, is power divided by voltage. So 3000 divided by 12 volts, that will be 250 amps. And when that current flows 
from the battery to the bulb, you will have some sort of a, a voltage drop because of the resistance uh, that we have in the in the wire, and that equates to 2.5 volts. So we started with a 12 volt battery, and by the time it reaches the voltage reaches the bulb or the machine in this case, it drops down to 9.5 volts. And, and similar is the case for the overall power that is available from the battery. So we start with a 3 kilowatt uh, battery uh, battery power, and there will be some losses in the in the cabling, and what the machine says will become uh, significantly lower than what we started at the battery. That equates to roughly around 80% efficiency, and, and this is a very very high level calculation, uh, just to show uh, how, how it um, how it increases with the voltage. So. If we look at a similar uh, voltage, um, uh, similar calculations for a higher voltage, example for a 48 volt, and, and the system is a 48 volt in this case, and, and the cell is uh, providing 48 volts, the, the equation changes drastically, and what you see is the system efficiency uh, starts increasing at a much higher value. So, so the key message I wanted to show here is that um, as we start increasing the voltage higher and higher, we start getting an increased efficiency of the overall system because of the less current that is flowing through the system and, and, and the less losses that is happening in the system. And a lot of people ask, okay, why, when, when the industry transitioned from 12 volts to, to the higher voltages, why did we stop at 48 volts? Why not, why not 40 volts or 32 volts? Uh, how, how can we come up with a, with, a, with a random figure of 48 volts? And that, that's not random. It, it was not uh, something uh, that happened in a tub when two engineers were having a conversation or anything like that. Um, when, when the industry was transitioning from 12 volts uh, through to uh, higher voltages, initially we were looking at uh, we were looking at 24 volts for a while. But um, if you remember the earlier slide that I was showing, there is a transition at 60 volts, which defines if it is a low voltage system or a high voltage system. And and when uh, the OEMs started specifying components for sub, sub suppliers and all, there wasn't a, a strict standard. So. A couple of OEMs started joining together and defining a, a specification that wanted to stay below the 60 voltage uh, range so that um, we don't have to provide any uh, special protection for wiring or fusing or shock protection, for example. Um, that meant that um, the high, highest voltage that, that the system sees is less than 60 volts. And when we start putting some over voltage protection for, for, for static and dynamic limits, we soon end up at a mean open voltage of around 48 uh, volts. And that's how the industry evolved uh, to from 12 volts to 24 volts, and then uh, now it's 48 volts. And, and the key advantage there is that the system, all the key components that have been used, is still um, staying within the 60 volts, which means that there isn't any, uh, any, any there is no need for any additional protection in, in the first place. So enough of uh, additional or outside of 48 volt uh, details. Let's go into the mild hybrid system um, on how it works and the overview of how the system is laid out in Ford. So predominant use of the 48 volt mild hybrid system within Ford is, is to maximize the CO2 benefit. And this is uh, done through uh, recuperating energy that is lost um, uh, during braking and also by doing engine stop starts when the vehicle is actually rolling. And this is made uh, possible uh, by the components that I was showing you earlier. So this is a schematic of how uh, the, the parts sit in the vehicle. So you'll see the 48-volt battery sitting um, where the passenger seat typically comes in. And um, we look at the integrated starter generator that goes into the front-end accessories for the engine. And we have a DC DC that is connected for the 12 volt uh, supply uh, on the vehicle and a 12 volt battery in there. So, so the key key um, advantage of having an MHF system uh, was that it was quite easy to implement on the existing one liter EcoBoost powertrain in the first place. And, and it started to offer a good value for money in terms of uh, uh, dollars spent versus percentage scale economy benefit that the customers are going to see for the system. And that is one of the major uh, major deciding factors when we start implementing or moving from one technology to the other. And uh, nevertheless, it's, it's something that is easily scalable to large volumes. And that is uh, for volume uh, players like Ford, uh, it, the technologies need to be scalable to large volumes. And that's one of the key factors that, uh, that decides what technology becomes readily available for the public. So if we look at um, the overall systematics of, of the M Health system, uh, as, as I was showing you earlier, the, the e-machine or the belt integrated starter generator 
starts sitting at the uh, at the engine, and when a regeneration uh, happens, i.e., when a customer is coasting or braking to a red light in the traffic, for example, uh, what happens is the leftover mechanical energy that is in the engine, because of engine braking in this case, is converted to electrical energy, and that is converted to AC internally in the ISD or integrated starter generator, and it's converted to DC at 48 volts, and that is fed through to the Beckham or the battery unit, which is a 48 volt lithium ion battery pack that sits underneath the passenger seat and gets stored there. A portion of the electrical energy also gets um, conveyed to the DC DC so that the 48 volt is stepped down to 12 volts and goes into the 12 volt battery of the vehicle so that the 12 volt is always kept uh, charged and also the rest of the consumers that is in the vehicle, i.e. all the 12 volt consumers like radio, uh, steering, um, heated wind screen, heated seats, you name it. Uh, so when, when this is happening all in, in the background, um, what the customer sees is, is none of this. All they're going to see inside the cluster is, is the mild hybrid gauge actually showing um, a, a green color and filling to the uh, anti-clockwise direction and the small battery icon showing that the battery is uh, starting to store the charges that is um, recuperated from the system. And what happens when the energy is recuperated and once the, once the uh, lights turn green after, after some time, the customer will drive away. So the customer steps into the accelerator pedal and the energy that is stored in the battery is now uh, traveling back and supporting the ISG to convert from electrical energy into mechanical energy and help the engine reduce the torque that is delivering. Which means that from a, from a typical engine operating point, uh, say for example on a, on, on a conventional internal combustion engine, if the, if the engine needed 100 newton meters, uh, if there is a um, mild hybrid system in place, the integrated starter generator can provide a portion of the torque so that there will be a certain amount of fuel saving in, in the vehicle. And again, the customer doesn't see any of this. All they see is uh, on the cluster, the mild hybrid gauge now goes clockwise and starts filling, filling in a blue color. And there will be a little telltale icon at the bottom showing that there is power given for driving the vehicle electrically. Um, if we talk a little bit about the regeneration and how it works in, in, in the vehicle, on a typical, um, uh, on a typical uh, conventional uh, internal combustion, uh, you see, um, sorry, before we talk about how it works, the x-axis is, is, is right-hand side is throttle and, and left-hand side is brake. And on the y-axis, we've got axle uh, and uh, y-axis, uh, bottom portion, we've got deceleration of the vehicle. So this y-axis is a vehicle domain and x-axis is accelerator pedal or brake that is being pressed by the customer. So when a customer lifts off their accelerator pedal, they will start at point one and then they transition to point two and then they reach at point three. So this is the point where uh, the customer will end up when they are fully off their um, accelerator pedal. And that's typically referred to uh, what in the industry or in commonly uh, among the customer will end in braking. So this is the total uh, total braking that the powertrain system and the vehicle in total provides for decelerating the vehicle. Uh, so that includes your engine braking, your, your, your transmission, uh, friction, your car uh, tires, air of the vehicle, drag, everything. So that will be the uh, level of vehicle deceleration uh, that a customer perceives when they lift off their accelerator pedal. And if the customer feels like there is a need for more deceleration, they start pressing the brakes and they transition through this line to whichever point that the customer likes. However, when we start moving on to a, a mild hybrid, Things are slightly different. So here again, the customer uh, starts at point one, and then they transition through point two. But as soon as uh, the system starts to recognize that the customers have uh, reached uh, a knee point, the mild hybrid system starts uh, kicking in and starts providing some additional torque, uh, which is shown by the green line. So instead of ending it, uh, the engine braking deceleration value, when a customer is fully off their accelerator pedal, what happens is they end up at a much lower deceleration value. So typically what I'm showing over here. So, that, so you, you'll see that there is a delta in terms of the vehicle deceleration that the customers will be feeling uh, on the vehicle. 
and this uh, this is the key point of 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 how M head system works. So you will definitely feel an in, a slightly increased deceleration of the vehicle, which means that the that the vehicle is regenerating and storing that energy into the mild hybrid uh, battery system that's available. So again, if the driver is going further on the brakes for additional deceleration, then the mild hybrid system and the friction brakes kick in, depending on what system you've got in place, and and provide additional braking. Uh, so, just regarding that point about additional braking from 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 this point down onwards, um, the regenerative braking when a customer presses the brakes is, is slightly dependent on what technology we have got uh, in in the, in the vehicle. There are two uh, that we use within Fords. Uh, one is a parallel braking and one is a series braking. So parallel braking is the one that I've shown on the left side. So on a parallel brake system, if the driver is pressing their brakes, uh, that is shown by the x-axis here. Um, the friction brakes and the regenerative brakes both provide uh, similar proportions of uh, similar proportions of braking torque, which means that the system is not clever to prioritize one or the other. So these are uh, these are the basic systems that is available um, for uh, for regenerative braking. And when we go into the premium segment vehicles, uh, we start getting um, electronic brake boosters and thereby serious braking functionality. So that is shown by the uh, series braking graph on the right hand side. So if a customer brakes like uh, again on a series braking system, um, the initial uh, deceleration or the braking request is fully uh, met by the uh, by the uh, regenerate by the regenerative brakes itself. So everything will be taken care of by the regenerative braking system. And once the regenerative braking system cannot um, provide a certain torque uh, or a regenerative braking. Maybe the battery is completely full, or there is an error, or beat whatever the scenario. Then the friction brakes uh, come in and start uh, compensating for that. So this this is one of the most safety critical uh, aspects of of mild hybrid system, where the, the braking and the mild hybrid system has to go in tandem, and and it has to make sure that there is no safety implications to how the braking is done in the first place. So going from all that braking events, how do we use that uh, stored energy once all that braking event is happening? So the main usage of um, having uh, the the stored energy and how we use it in, in Ford is predominantly is for torque substitution. This is what we call it in Ford. Um, so in, in, in simple terms, what we do is uh, on a conventional engine, so I'm just showing this in a pictorial way here. On a, on a conventional engine, if, if the engine has to provide a certain amount of torque, um, the engine basically uses the fuel to provide a certain amount of torque. But when we have a mild hybrid system, what happens is the electric machine is able to provide a certain amount of torque to the engine so that uh, the engine has to operate at a much lesser um, fueling. So what that directly means is there is always a fuel saving when the torque substitution is happening. And that is the bang for buck, if you if you ask me, for for the mild hybrid system. So always, when, whenever the substitution is happening, the, the more the regeneration is happening, the more energy is stored into the battery. The more energy is stored into the battery, the more talk substitution we are able to do and save uh, money for the customers. So how does it look like on a on a on a typical drive, for example? So what you see here is is a, a typical real world drive where you've got vehicle speed at the top. And motor power, which is the machine or the integrated starter generator power um, that goes through during the drive. So as we start accelerating the vehicle, we see that the uh, e-machine starts to kick in, and with positive power, which means we are substituting and helping the engine go through some hard operating points of the engine. And what the customer sees is, is a blue uh, mild hybrid icon, as I was showing you earlier. And when we reach the crest point of uh, of the hill, when we start decelerating the vehicle, the exact opposite thing happens, and the vehicle starts to be uh, regenerating uh, because of the deceleration of the vehicle. When the when the customer lifts off the accelerator pedal, and you'll see that the motor power is going negative as well. So, all the regenerative energy that is used to move the uh, engine operating point to a more efficient window is, is always good for uh, saving fuel in the first place. Another use for uh, for the stored energy or, or the recuperated energy is what we call torque supplement. We do it two ways, and I'll come to that in detail. Uh, so the torque supplement is, is uh, 
is a condition where if the traditional engine can provide a certain amount of torque, the mild hybrid e-machines can um, provide torque over and above what the engine can do. So instead of offsetting the torque like earlier, what the mild hybrid system is able to do is you can provide torque above what the engine is capable of uh, doing at that point. What it means is that the engine becomes more responsive, your torque envelope starts going up and you will get more uh, more perform performance out of the engine. So when we put the NH system into uh, and into the one liter EcoBoost engine, which already is, is loved by the customers, we start seeing what we are seeing on the screen. So on the x-axis, so this is a typical torque curve uh, for the engine. So you've got uh, engine speed on the x-axis and the engine torque on the y-axis. And uh, the yellow um, area, uh, the, uh, the yellow line that you see here is um, the torque curve of uh, Hopefully uh, you can zoom, you can see this a bit more zoomed in. So the yellow line is, is the torque curve for the engine on its own. And as we start putting a mild hybrid system on top of it, we start getting additional torque throughout the whole operating envelope of the engine until we reach 4,000 RPM, which is where the max capability of this particular machine is. And that, uh, um, and that kind of uh, helps us in, uh, in, increasing the operating envelope of the engine and providing more performance on top of uh, what the engine is already able to deliver. So if you go to the absolute numbers, uh, so in the lower uh, envelope uh, of the engine operating range, we are able to provide up to Newton meters and at the top we are able to provide around 20 additional Newton meters of torque, thereby uplifting the overall engine curve and providing much more responsive engine. So what it feels to the customers? is an instant and connected feel uh, when they start driving the vehicle. All of a sudden, you, you have <coughs> a product that is uh, really fun to drive and, and, good <coughs> and, and you get good support from the powertrain at uh, especially low engine speeds. So one of the key metrics that we measure in Ford's is, is um, what we call um, a tipping, which means uh, the, the vehicle will be um, uh, crawling in third gear or fourth gear in these examples, for it, like, like these examples, and the operator will um, press the accelerator pedal quickly and see how fast the uh, vehicle acceleration increases over uh, the next one, two, three, four seconds, so that we can capture how um, connected and how uh, sporty the vehicle feels. Like. So, on, on a typical uh, third gear tipping, um, the the difference that we see with and without the MH system is is humongous because. Um, on a non mh system, we have typically one meter per second square of, of acceleration after one second. But when we start putting the mild hybrid system on top of it, we start uh, increasing the capability to 1.64. The, the numbers might seem very small, but when you sit in the car and feel that, that is that is definitely something that complements uh, the powertrain that is already uh, liked by the customers. So using this kind of complementary technology together with uh, with an existing powertrain that is equally delivering good torque levels is, is kind of loved by the customers in the first place. So another important feature that we provide for the mild hybrid is, is the rowing stop starts. Um, so this is, uh, <laughs> to my surprise, this was one of the best loved features when we when we took the vehicle out uh, for uh, the press release when, when the vehicle was being released. So one of the customer, one of the press uh, customers, uh, journalists, actually drove the vehicle, and and they uh, they felt the mild hybrid system uh, restart, and they were like commenting, "Oh, this this starts within a blink of an eye." And that's when we started comparing, uh, start timing the blink of an eye, and, and and starting to compare how fast our system is. <laughs> uh, we were tuning mostly to to the to the engine dynamics, to 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 pass through the resonance quite quickly, and and end up at a good idle speed without overshooting and things like that. But um, at times you need a fresh eyes to to make sure that, it, that the product is as good as or even better than what you anticipated. And, and comments like this come into play. But anyways, the, the point here is like uh, on the rolling stop start, um, the we are able to stop the engine even when the vehicle is, is rolling, uh, and this is configura configurable by the driver itself or herself. And this can happen up to 820 kph. And because of the mild hybrid system that stays in the field. The front end accessory is dry. Um, the, the stopping of the engine and starting of the engine is almost instantaneous. So a, a driver, if they change their mind from, from the vehicle stopping to uh, accelerating away, there isn't any any delay 
that the customer will perceive because by the time they blink their eyes, it's already up and running. Uh, so that's one of the most loud features uh, for the MHA system itself. Um, so if we talk about other 48 volt implementations in the industry, um, a few upcoming ones or something that are already out there in the market is, is an E-Turbo and an e -Turbo. Both of which uh, is there uh, to improve the performance of the engine one way or the other. Uh, so on an e-turbo, typically everybody knows there is always a turbo lag as opposed to turbo because it takes time for the exhaust gas to to to, to go through and and spin up the turbos. But if we imagine if we, if we have a 48 volt system in place and if we are um, powering the 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 motor with uh, with a 48 volt system. You can inst instantaneously spin up the turbo to the target speed, and you will be able to provide pressure. So there will be there will be hardly any 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 boost lag that is there. So that is one of the technologies that is that has been uh, available in the market, and so is the e-catalyst as well. Um, so on a catalyst, a typical problem that the industry faces is is the time the catalyst takes to heat up, so that uh, the initial cold drive um, during emissions testing or for a normal drive flow for a customer as well. That initial drive until the e-catalyst uh, heats up is, is very critical because that's the time when you have most of the emissions numbers spiking too high. And, and if we can heat up the catalyst quite quickly, we will be able to provide a much lower emissions value and, and, and um, save the planet uh, and do our bit to the, to the industry. So in summary, um, the 48 volt mild hybrid system is, 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 is a technology that complements the existing powertrain very much. And, and it is overall positive for um, multiple attributes uh, like drivability, performance, and fuel economy. And, and this uh, technology has been a part of Ford's high volume electrification strategy um, that uh, we are rolling out in the upcoming years. And obviously, it also forms a major part of our FE compliance, fuel economy compliance for the, for the next few years, um, which we are trying to roll out. So um, you would have already seen, before I finish off the deck, you would have already seen um, a few uh, new press releases for uh, exciting products like e-transit coming up soon. So that, that's all a part of the, the next generation of hybridizations that we are planning to come out with. And you will for sure see some exciting products um, in the coming years, which, uh, um, which I'm not allowed to talk uh, <laughs> for various reasons uh, in the forum here. Otherwise, uh, I might have Jason Statham coming to my home and, and picking me and putting me in his car and driving me off to the dungeon, maybe. But anyways, um, um, but thank you for listening. So that's all uh, I wanted to share from the deck. Um, if you have any questions, please please come forward. Um, uh, Steve and uh, Co will be uh, passing those questions over to us, and we'll be happy to answer that for you. Thank you very much. Steve, are you there? Sorry, thank you, Apple. Uh, I, I, the, the joys of talking to a mute button. Apologies. Um, <laughs> My pleasure. So, uh, thank you, thank you to all the speakers. What I'll now do is uh, pull together some of the questions. And what I what I would like to do, I think there are a few that probably are best answered by Sigurd. Um, and it's probably best that we kind of switch to Sigurd being able to take some of those questions. But let me, what I'll do is I'll try and try and answer as many of the questions as we can. Um, but let me just, let me start with a few questions for Sigurd. And I think the first one was from Chas Morland. Uh, and that was, do the suspension changes result in a hard ride? And I think the question was raised around changing the stiffness relative Relative to Fiesta, uh, when we uh, apply the suspension updates to to Puma, so Sigurd, would you like to take that one? Yeah, sure, I would. Uh, so, um, so let's first see um, the target customer for Puma is clearly the family, and the car, as I think I, I outlined before. Uh, it's also designed for long distance journeys, right? You have a lot of space, you can carry a lot of goods, it's for kind of vacation, long journeys, etc. Because of that, we paid attention to comfort and ride. So secondary ride, primary ride are all tuned to be comfortable on a long distance driving. 
Um, I also mentioned things like lumbar massage, etc. So it's really a package, and we have that target to make it comfortably uh, for the um, for the family and for long distance driving. While on the other side, trying to maximize the fun to drive still, because that's our DNA. And I think all the feedback we got from various press drives, uh, media drives, etc. But meanwhile, also we have the first customer quality feedback. I think we found that sweet spot. So customers are happy with the comfort. So it's not too abrupt. The ride is not rough, etc. It's really spot on. And the car is, those of you who drove the car, is fun to drive. There's probably a little bit of an exception, but that's normal. If you take the wheel with the, uh, the smallest aspect uh, ratio of the tires, so the largest wheel, the 19 inch, you do get a bit of choppiness, um, yes. But that's not more than you get on any other car with the largest wheel and tire. And from the customer feedback we get, those that order the car or that buy and purchase the cars with the largest tire and wheel combination, that typically know that trade-off and they do that trade-off in full awareness of um, that it does compromise a bit the comfort. But the 17 and the 18 inch, which is the, uh, the mass of the vehicles, um, have the right uh, the right trade-off. Okay, uh, kind of from from that. Is there a technical justification? This question came from Alex Circle. Um, is there a technical justification behind the use of 19-inch wheels rather than 18 or 17? So on the ni so on the base Puma, we have 17, 18, and 19. And for the winter tires, even 16, so the complete bandwidth. I think the question is more um, focused on the uh, ST, and I think I, uh, I forward that uh, that answer over to Stefan. Um, yeah, okay. Why the ST only has the 19 inch? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so, well, overall, obviously, you know, size of the tire somewhat defines the tire patch size, the contact patch with the road. So the larger diameter, right, uh, and the wider the tire is, the larger is your tire patch. So that's in, gen in general beneficial for grip, right? However, if you take a given tire diameter, and that, I think that's somewhat what the question is geared towards. So with a given tire diameter, if you then change the uh, between 17, 18, and 19, you're changing the aspect ratio of the tire. Right? That, that's what you're virtually doing. And changing the aspect ratio, you're changing the characteristic of the tire. So the smaller the the the, the smaller the aspect ratio is, um, you get the tendency to lose, you know, have less compliance in the tire. So you get a more direct steering response, but you're also yes uh, running the risk of uh, increasing rolling harshness. But then it's important that your suspension is tuned together with the tire. So if you have a given tire size, and on a ST, on a ST we only have 19 inch, so our suspension setting is optimized for this particular tire size. And I mentioned the FRD system earlier, the frequency response of dampening. That's, that's a key enabling technology to take out some of the harshness that a, that a 19 inch tire can introduce. Right, so it, it's beneficial for steering, but you have to deal with the with the rolling harshness uh, that is somewhat tied to a lower aspect ratio. But you can do that it, with with proper tuning. You can address the, those constraints, and which I think we did with ST. Thank you for that, Stefan. The next question I have is slightly, I guess, slightly more. Or uh, an interesting one, particularly in the UK at the moment, with the government's announcement this week to pull forward the the move towards full electrification and the uh, banning of the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles. Could you provide an insight into any of the to the Ford's response to that UK um, announcement? And maybe what, what could you share with us any of the plans around BEV or existing uh, BEV versions of the existing models, or in fact a reduced lineup? I guess you need to be careful, Sigurd, on that. But I guess if there's anything you can share, that would be, would be useful. No, of course. Uh, thanks, uh, Steve. For um, so the UK announcement in itself, I think, is not 
not a big surprise. We have other markets uh, in Europe, um, like Norway, Netherlands, for instance, that also have announced very aggressive plans. And I think most of us know, mean, know meanwhile, the, uh, the stage seven um, limitations, which also put a lot of burden on, on ice power trains. For that reason, um, I think Ford has a very aggressive uh, electrification strategy, right? If we, um, if we just look for this year, uh, the year is almost over. We have uh, introduced 19 different powertrains, electrified powertrains, starting from the mild hybrids over um, normal hybrids, uh, but also plug-ins. So uh, the highlights are the, the Cougar plug-in, Explorer plug-in, but also full best like uh, the Mustang Mach-E. And um, I think it was this week announced the Transit uh, BEF. Um, so it's quite a rich electrification strategy. And uh, we've also announced mid of this year um, a cooperation um, with VW on, um, on the electrified platform MEB for our passenger vehicle portfolio. So Ford, I think, is prepared uh, to go aggressive and in an accelerated manner towards um, electrification. That's, that's very clear. I can't give you any, any inter the details and further um, further future product um, uh, insights, unfortunately. I thank you. You all understand that. No, thank you, Sigurd. We, we completely understand your need to be able to have some level of confidentiality around what Ford's future plans are. Um, let me just kind of switch kind of direction slightly, and I think these questions probably end up with Apple, so hopefully you can feel those, Apple. One from Mark Coe here. Firstly, thank you for a great presentation. A question around the MHEV. I drove a 125 PS MHEV for a week and felt the coast down regeneration a little too intrusive. How is that? level of uh, deceleration de defined, and is that a Ford or industry standard? Uh, so, Steve, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yes, what uh, Mark felt was definitely uh, right. So, compared to uh, a normal conventional internal combustion engine vehicle, especially if the customers are transitioning from a traditional conventional vehicle uh, to a mild hybrid, you will feel the increase in uh, deceleration of the vehicle when, when a customer lifts off. And, and that is not defined by any government standards. There is a government standard for the, for the mean value that we should be targeting at. But Ford internally has a, has a brand DNA for that. So we have, uh, for all the products in, in the mild hybrid or the hybridized architecture itself, we've got a DNA that we have to follow uh, in terms of the vehicle deceleration coming from high vehicle speeds through to, through to low speeds until you're crawling to full stop. Um, so there is a DNA that uh, all four vehicles have to fit in and, and all vehicles will be following that DNA as well. But what the what Mark felt was exactly true and that was that's what I was showing on the on one of my slides as well, how region works, you will feel an increased uh, deceleration of the vehicle. Not too intrusive if you ask me, uh, unless you are a very, very tuned driver to your to your driving skills. So it seems like Mark is uh, so uh, yes, it's, it's true, but we are following the Ford standards rather than any, um, any government standards. To the point of government standards, um, there is a, a requirement for the government standards to to light up the brake lights if we are going below a certain value uh, at minus 1.3 meter per second square. So if we are exceeding those values or decelerating much faster than that, then we have to uh, light up the brake lights. That's the, that's the only requirement in terms of the government regulations in place. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Um, so maybe I can uh, can I maybe add something if that's possible, Steve. Please do so good. Yeah, so I think um, the the observation is right. Um, I'm driving a Puma now since uh, eight months, and um, I think what needs to be notified is typically you get used to this, right? It's 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 abnormal first time you drive the car, but our experience is driving the car for a couple of days. Definitely after weeks, you absolutely get used to this. Uh, you also have the choice when you change the drive modes between eco, normal, and sport. Uh, the level of deceleration is uh, changing. So the customer has a bit of a choice whether he wants more or a bit less. And if you see at the other level of the bookend, which is our full electric vehicles like the Mach-E, 
the level of deceleration is also adjustable in the menu is a lot more, right? So I think uh, the trend will go towards this. It's unused to us. We're driving the, since 20, 30, 40 years, traditional ISIS yeah. with normal coast downs, but BEFs will get to a lot more diesel. And you get used to that. Up to uh, in the Mach E, we have a one pedal drive. You don't even need to use the brake pedal. You, you kind of diesel with the gas pedal and you only use the, the brake pedal in emergency braking. So um, that needs time, but um, yeah, it's, um, we need to get used to that one. That's definitely right. Okay, a couple, a couple of kind of related questions around the, the MHEV system and the relationship between MHEV 48 volt and the 12 volt. Roy Horrocks asked the question, is it, you know, with the 12 volt lead acid battery being heavy, could that be, could this be deleted from the 48 volt uh, with the about volt battery in the normal car? And, and what's limit what's limiting us from changing to a whole 48 volt architecture? Um, there's, there's a couple of, uh, I guess, Steve, that is a question to me, right? Yeah, please, Athel. Uh, so there, there are a couple of reasons why we have uh, got the 12 volt battery. Yes, I agree. Uh, the 12 volt battery is slightly he on the heavier side, but um, the way how that mild hybrid system operates is um, when uh, so imagine if a customer is going to the car and starting the car, the M system because it is slightly on the high voltage side, it has to do some safety checks to make sure that all the systems are reporting the right voltages, right currents, uh, the communications are right. All those kind of safety checks has to be done before allowing current to flow. And, and for the currents to flow, um, what happens inside the 48 volt battery, there is a there is a switch, there is a contactor inside the battery. And for that battery to operate and, and the current to be allowed to flow from within or outside of the battery, um, you need some sort of power. Uh, so lead acid battery, the 12 volt battery is definitely used for uh, doing the initial diagnostics of the MHF system and powering on the MHF system so that the rest of the drive can be done with the with the 48 volt battery and the MHF system. The second uh, rationale for having a 12 volt battery is for the first um, cold start that is done on the vehicle. So imagine a customer gets up in the morning, uh, they want to go out, so they come to the car and the first uh, cold start will need to be done with the with the uh, with the 12 volt battery. Uh, the 48 volt lithium ion batteries for now are un this is predominantly a problem in the cold countries. So imagine places like Trinidad or other parts in Europe where it is slightly on the colder side. Um, the lithium ion batteries are not great for cold. Um, if you see a, a Tesla uh, or any of the high volume manufacturers like Tesla where you've got a, a big battery system, you need to warm up the battery first to make sure that it, it reaches the optimum temperature for operation. So again, on those kind of conditions, when we start, the, when we do the first cold start, we need the 12 volt batteries to do a, a normal cranking of the engine. Once again, the, uh, when the safety checks are done from the mild hybrid side, you can close the contactors and all the work has been done. Probably in, in a few years, once the battery technology has improved a little bit, uh, which we are able to withstand minus 20, 30 degrees with a 48 volt lithium ion battery, we might be able to have a completely uh, um, a complete system where uh, we can just rely on the 48 volt battery to, to do the initial checks and, and put contactors and things like that. But for now, uh, yes, <laughs> this is how it is. <laughs> yeah, and uh, may um, also that's a good good uh, good summary. If I may add to that one as well. So um, because all the start stop events are being done by the um, the mild hybrid system with a blink of an eye, right? Like you explained it, also. Um, that allowed us uh, to uh, decrease the battery size. So the 12 volt battery size in terms of capacity is smaller. I think it's a 50 amperes hours battery. It's uh, around, uh, roughly 20 to 25% smaller. Um, however, what I think you need to take into account, and we did that study, if you change the complete vehicle architecture over to a 48 volt system, every single module, every single motor, every single headlamp, tail lamp, everything. There is no kind of industry standard. The complete standard is on 12 volt. You pay a super surplus in terms of cost. So we did the study. The industry seems not ready for 48 volt system on all the controllers, on all the electronic architecture. So that's a difficulty, obviously, for us as an OEM. 
because the complete supply base, um, be it the Bosch's, the Conti's of this world, they're all focusing on the, um, the 12 volt systems um, in terms of uh, the controllers and the headlamps, so on. So um, that needs the time until the complete architecture would, would switch over. No, thank uh, you. That's, that, that's a very useful insight, Sigurd, about trying to keep cars cost efficient as well as, as, well as fuel efficient. Um, a question from Kamud Harath um, around the MHEV. As the BISG is transmitting torque, are there any issues around pulley wear and durability of the belt system? And, and also a supplementary question around the same thing is what, what's the fuel economy benefit from the, the compared with the additional weight of the MHEV components? Um, so maybe I'll ask um, the second question first. Um, so uh, there is an additional um, weight for the MHEV system. I agree that. But um, it's it's definitely much uh, fuel efficient when we uh, when we weigh the increase in weight versus uh, the fuel economy benefit that we were getting because of the system uh, being in place. We did a lot of studies to to make sure that the systems are right sized, the right weight, to make sure that we are at the optimum point in terms of the weight uh, package uh, ratio as well. Uh, so the the benefit is definitely there, even with the additional weight of the NHEP system, we are able to. Uh, to get an offset for the for the fuel economy. If you see, um, I don't know, customers might have seen this, but the, the Gen One that we introduced in in, in the Puma mild hybrid had a had a bigger battery, and that used to sit in the boot uh, of of Puma. Uh, but soon we realized that that we we needed to downsize that, and, and we were able to downsize that quickly. And and the Gen Two product for the for the mild hybrid system in Puma is is now much more compact and lightweight as well, approximately. Uh, kilos for the batteries, if I'm, if I'm right. Um, and the first question, going back to, was regarding the belt um, wear, right? Yes, you're right. So um, the belt system, how uh, it is implemented on the vehicle, we've got uh, um, an active sphere tensioner to make sure that there is always tension on the belt. So you can imagine a belt that is running around in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in the sphere. You will. When the, when the engine starts regenerating or when the IC starts regenerating and uh, doing assist um, both clockwise and anti-clockwise, you will have a slack side and, and, and the tension side on the, on the belt. That is definitely, that was one of the initial problems that we had. We had to retune the, the front end accessories, drive pulleys, uh, the uh, fear tensioners um, that we have in, in the Puma. We had to tune all those with a lot of uh, reruns. Uh, with the engine and the end health system put into the uh, into the rig, uh, doing so many stop starts because uh, compared to compared to traditional uh, internal combustion engine, these systems are doing stop starts left, right, and center. So, so the amount of durability was definitely a concern for us. And the initial couple of iterations were not uh, doing us favor. I agree that. But uh, by the time we came into uh, the, the the launch phase of the products, we had the system ready. Uh, with the right level of durability uh, that is um, that is predicted for for the vehicle of life, life of the vehicle, so that was a concern for us. But we have uh, addressed it. We have done the durability run in the vehicle, and uh, by running vehicles in in over their lifetime, in in normal way, we start running vehicles for a long time, 24 hours, uh, 24 or 7, uh, with trained drivers overall <laughs> in, in different types of tracks. So all those kind of durability assessments have been done to make sure that the parts are withstanding the, the wear and tear and, and the tension that the, that the system can put in place. Thank you. I, I'm going to switch. I, I recognize we've got quite a few questions left and we've only got a few more minutes, but let me let me just pick out a couple of these to, uh, to come back to Sigurd, I think. And that is, um, will the hybrid be available with an automatic transmission? And as a supplementary question to that, can I have an ST with an auto, with an automatic transmission? Well, the problem is I, we cannot speculate about the future, but I can circle back to what I said before. Um, so first of all, so we launched Puma early this year um, as a manual only. Uh, we then added the um, the automatic mid gear as well as the diesel. We added now uh, the ST just about a month ago. And uh, there is more to come next year. That's all I can say at this time. Just the questions clarify: Is the is the MHEV available with automatic? No, no. Not okay. Nope. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, and, and just finally, uh, recognising we've got a couple of minutes left, um, let me just think. What type of electrical architecture does the vehicle have? And also, is all, all, uh, is this also also an update to the, in the new vehicle? Um, what can you repeat the question again, Steve? What kind of electrical architecture? Yeah, does the vehicle have? So, in terms of electrical architecture, we are um, so so. This is not a, the M has is, as I was uh, telling earlier. It's not a disruptive technology where we are tearing apart the vehicle and and introducing new things all of a sudden. This is a technology which kind of complements the existing technology and makes many changes and and makes sure that we are getting some benefits to the customers. So, in terms of the vehicle architecture or the communications um, architecture, uh, the, the CAN connections. There's slight modifications uh, for including additional modules like the ISG, DC, DC, and the battery. But other than that, the vehicle architecture for electrical and comms uh, communications as well is staying pretty much the same um, for for the transition from a traditional uh, internal combustion engine to a mild hybrid. Thank you. Uh, and just one final question from Mike Burrows. It, Will the will will a mild hybrid vehicle Puma be considered as a hybrid in the UK, meaning that it would be able to be sold beyond beyond twenty thirty or thirty five? Difficult for me to answer. I don't know from all the market the uh, the taxation rules offhand whether mild hybrids in the UK count as a as a hybrid and therefore. Get some privileges um, over over normal ISIS. Every every market, unfortunately, is acting differently in Europe. Every single market. Some do treat mild hybrids as a full hybrid. Others don't treat it. I just don't know how UK treats it at this moment in time. I would like to pass it over, maybe to you, Steve, or anyone else online. I just don't have that one number and that Tim, answer. I don't know if Tim Tim or Andrew could answer that one. I, I don't know. Okay. Um, at which point? No, I, sorry, Steve. I, 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 it's Andrew here. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, the uh, head of all level spoke today, and she said that the although they haven't finalised it yet, the expectation and her exact words were that the cars which are allowed to continue sale after 2030 will have to have substantial zero emission driving range. That was from the head of OLEV at the okay. uh, low CB. So the Mild hybrids, unfortunately, would not qualify under that requirement. Neither will conventional, like Toyota-style hybrids. It'll have to really be a plug-in hybrid with a significant ZE range. Okay, thank you, Andrew. At which point, I am actually going to try and wrap this up, and I'd personally like to thank Sigurd, Stefan, and Athol for their superb presentation. Great uh, opportunity to share. Uh, and really just bringing their expertise and knowledge into this forum. So thank you all, uh, and I'd like to thank all the supporting people who've made this possible tonight. Please remember, look at the IMECI near you um, website. We're trying to do these on a monthly basis, um, and you'll see, I think, the next presentation that we will be doing actually is in January. Up for the IMECI automobile division, but there are other presentations from the South Essex area, like the steam train development that I talked about earlier. So please have a look at the IMECI near you online. You'll find loads of opportunities to get involved in these kind of presentations. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Sigurd. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Apple. I think you did a great job. And I. Uh, Wish you all a good a good evening and thank you. Good evening and good night. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. Yeah, thanks very much. Bye.